what were we looking at in that splash screen? I totally forgot to ask you in the green room. What? Oh, that was, that was a that was a carpenter bee. Yeah, up That's close. Like bee. Okay. Well, look, I can't even tell. You transformed it, holding true to the title, transforming the small into the spectacular. We're going to be diving really into the uh, the nuts and bolts of macro photography over the next hour. I want to send a, also a special thank you to Mike from OM System, who's going to be joining us in the background. So if you guys do have any tech questions, anything about the OM System gear. Oh, look at that. We got special appearance. Hello, everyone. We didn't even have to twist your arm, Mike. Yes. I yes. love it. I'll be in the background. Thank there you. There we go. So Mike's <laughs> going to be in the background. Uh, anything, even if it's not Mac related. If you guys do have any question on anything OM System at all. Feel free to get that in. That's why we have Mike on hand. So send a huge welcome to our audience joining us out there on the internet, over on YouTube and Vimeo. And of course, everybody who's joining us on Zoom here. Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, if you guys do have any questions, feel free to get them into the comments section. Chris, I'll see you in a bit for some Q&A. All right. Thank you. All right. My screen is shared. Let me start this up. Okay, so welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, wherever you may be. Thank you, B and H, Derek, Mike, for joining from OM System, uh, and thank you to everyone that's joining today, wherever you're joining from. Uh, so, as was introduced, I will be talking to you today about this presentation I've made up close, transforming the small into the spectacular. And today's really going to be about getting up close uh, and filling the frame with very small subjects. And I feel like this quote uh, from Robert Kappa sets the stage. It says, if your pictures aren't good enough, you aren't close enough. And Robert Kappa was a war journalist, photographer, photojournalist. Uh, he certainly wasn't talking about insects or spiders with this quote, but I really do think it applies here. So let's get started. First up, a uh, real quick background about me. Uh, my name is Chris McGinnis. I was born and raised in Brick, New Jersey. Uh, I've lived here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for the past 25 years. I graduated with a degree in graphic design from Moravian College, and I am now an OM System Ambassador Photographer. And uh, if you don't know OM System, that's okay. Uh, you may know OM by its formerly name, which is Olympus. So I may use those terms, OM System and Olympus interchangeably, but uh, the company is now known as OM System. And I began shooting photography back about 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, uh, with film photography, you know, developed my own film in the darkroom, the old fashioned way, but I've been specializing in macro photography in the field since 2016. And before we get into the weeds, so to speak, I want to be clear about what I mean when I say field macro photography. So field macro is all about um, smaller subjects out in nature. I often refer to these subjects as the little things. We typically consider this type of photography to be in situation, or some people say in situ. And that's where we're showing a photo of a subject in its natural environment. And for me, that's what I love about field macro photography. I love searching for the subjects, interacting with them, you know, discovering new things, things that are new to me, and then being able to bring people into that world that I've discovered through my photography. Um, and I also love the inherent challenge that this type of photography brings. And if you've ever tried macro, you may know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about that challenge. But what happens when we get even closer? Well, we get photos like these. So high magnification macro beyond that just traditional one-to-one -one macro photography. Uh, but this type of photography is actually a little bit more challenging, right? First of all, you need to find the subjects. Sometimes they're very easy to find, and sometimes they're totally hidden away. Once you find subjects, you need to get quite close to them to make these types of photos, and you need to do that without scaring them away. Um, you'll need special equipment. <clears throat> You'll need to be able to create this level of high magnification. Um, you'll need to understand the settings, how to expose for your scene. And we'll talk a lot today about being able to manage depth of field, because remember, depth of field isn't just about aperture. It's also about distance from subject. And we're very close to our subjects here for these types of photos. As distance from subject decreases, 
so does depth of field. So real quick, here's what we're gonna be covering for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I could talk for hours, we have less than one today, but I really do want you to walk away with some nice takeaways. And uh, you know, I'm happy to answer questions, whether it be today at the end, or um, I'm very accessible via my website or social media, and you can always reach out and I will certainly get back to you. Uh, but first up, we'll be finding and approaching subjects. We'll cover my macro gear. I'll give you my exact settings that I use to make the photos that I'm showing today. Get into that big magnification and understand what magnification means and how to get it. Talk about focus. Again, managing depth of field is going to be a big topic. And then as a piggyback onto managing depth of field, focus bracketing and focus stacking. And then we'll round things out with five tips for big results. So one of the greatest things about macro is all of the opportunities. Macro subjects are literally everywhere. But one of the number one questions that I get is where do you find these subjects? And a lot of times people are surprised when I say, write my own backyard. Um, but you can certainly travel to exotic destinations, but what's great is you don't have to. So while you can absolutely go to those exotic destinations, I encourage it. I'd love to go to these places myself. I have some upcoming trips planned and you can book those trips to travel with me if you want. Um, but most of the time I'm shooting in places like this. And while this is kind of a pretty photo, this is the park down the street from my house, uh, three minutes away. And I'm sure you have parks like this where you live and you'd really be amazed at what you can find very close to home. Uh, and it's one of the things that I love about macro is how accessible it is for so many people. And speaking of local parks, uh, you may actually discover that your town where you live has things like this. So these signs indicate dedicated pollinator projects, uh, pollinator fields or no mow zones and local parks departments designate areas where they're trying to encourage wildflower growth and encourage local pollinators. So contact your local parks department. If you have one of these areas in your area, then you've got a great place to go shoot macro. Um, so on the left, that sign is from here in Bethlehem. And th that's the photo that I showed on the previous slide. And I'm there all the time. And I can stay there for hours and have endless macro opportunities. Once you do find the subjects, the way that you approach them is very important. Uh, most macro subjects don't want you getting close to them. Uh, most insects can fly, spiders are really fast. So be sure to go out in the morning. That's gonna make your life much easier. Insects and spiders are ectotherms. They heat up, they get faster, they move around. When they're uh, cold in the morning, when the temperature's a little lower, they're going to be slower and that's going to be much easier for you. But regardless of when you find a subject, really be sure that you approach slowly. Um, and this has to be pretty deliberate because you're going to be excited. You're going to see the subject, oh, that's what I want to photograph, and you may have a tendency to rush in. Slow down, avoid sudden movements. Insects are really tuned into movement, and the slower you move, the better chance you have of getting close. And as you're approaching, take shots along the way. Uh, I know that the urge to go in really close immediately can be kind of overwhelming, but take shots along the way. And even if your subject flies away or runs away, when you do get in close, at least you're walking away with something. You've got shots. Um, and best case scenario, you do get in close and get to make that picture that you had in your head. But before you hit the field, you obviously need some gear. Uh, macro is really nice because you don't need a ton of gear, but there are some basics that you are going to need. So up first, the brand new OM system, OM1 Mark II, just announced. You may have seen that announcement. Uh, I've been using that camera for the last couple of months. It's the follow-up to the OM1, and uh, it's awesome. Super compact, weather sealed, awesome image stabilization, lots of great features, uh, not just for macro, but uh, for me, the macro features are really awesome, and I'll get into those a little bit in a second. My lens of choice is the OM System 90mm f3.5 Macro IS Pro. So long name, uh, great lens, uh, and I'll get into those details in a minute as well. 
And then the third real essential is a flash. Um, and this was the biggest game changer for me. So if you're shooting macro or you've dabbled in macro and you're not using a flash or you never have, I really encourage you to get a flash. This is the FL700 WR that's compatible with my camera, whatever flash is compatible with your camera. This is really a fairly basic speed light style mounts to the hot shoe flash, and it can really change uh, your macro photography for the better. All right, so here's the OM system, OM1 Mark II at a glance. I'll let you read through that. I'm not gonna read every one of these specs to you and take up time, but I do wanna mention a couple that are really key for high magnification macro photography. Um, focus bracketing and focus stacking in camera are absolute game changers. If you don't know what they are, I'm gonna get into it in a little bit, but being able to automate those things in camera really, really allows me to make images that I think I would have a really hard time with a different system. And I also want to point out that this is a crop sensor camera. So it's a four third sensor that's about half the size of a full frame sensor. And sometimes that can be perceived as negative. But in this case, it's really a major advantage. Um, and it's a major advantage in my eyes, because my results appear to be magnified twice the size of the results of a full frame. I'm going to show that when I talk about magnification in a few minutes. Um, but also, I will get greater perceived depth of field than I would with a larger sensor camera. So these things are inherently in my favor when working with the crop sensor camera. And now for the lens. The 90 millimeter f3.5 macro IS Pro. I absolutely love this lens. Um, if you shoot with another system, of course, you're going to need a compatible macro lens for your system, but everyone's got them, right? Every manufacturer, every lens manufacturer makes macro lenses. You'll want to find one that fits your system, and you'll be looking for something that offers one-to-one -one or greater magnification. That's what we consider macro. Um, but what makes this one so great, right? Why am I so excited about it? Well, I was actually the first photographer in the world, I believe, to take this camera out into the field and test it. So I got to go on an epic trip to Costa Rica, got to take hundreds of images. Uh, so it really has a special place in my heart, but it's really all about the features. This lens is weather sealed. So out in the pouring rain, no problem. Out in the snow, no problem. It offers extreme magnification up to 2X natively, uh, which kind of looks like 4X on a full frame, or even up to 4X natively when you add a teleconverter. So really, really high magnification capabilities and versatility. And it has great autofocus. That is not normal with macro lenses. A lot of macro lenses don't even have autofocus. Um, and last but not least, it has image stabilization in the lens, which really, really comes into play at high magnification. Because when you're magnifying your image, you're also magnifying your movements. Few more items as far as my gear goes. Uh, I won't go into as much detail with these, but OM does offer a few other, two other macro lenses in the 30 millimeter and 60 millimeter. The 30 millimeter is kind of your inexpensive entry level macro lens. It's really, really tiny. It's only about uh, inch and a half or two inches long, uh, but I really find that's best for inanimate subjects. So I don't recommend that as much for in the field use with live subjects but the 60 macro was my go-to for years. Uh, until the 90 came out, I used that lens for several years and it's a really great, really small, affordable macro lens. And then in the center, you see that crazy kind of hood over my flash and that's a diffuser. And a diffuser is really important. This is the Cygnus Tech macro diffuser, um, which is a handmade custom order diffuser, which you order directly from uh, Brendan James who makes them in Australia. Uh, but there's lots of options available. The idea is that you're softening the light before it hits your subject. And that's so important because with macro, you're so close that your light can be really intense on your subject and you need a way to kind of interrupt that intensity. And the last items I'll show here as far as equipment are teleconverter, the Raynox DCR250 and extension tubes. Uh, so the Olympus or OM teleconverter, that is compatible with the 90 millimeter macro, which is pretty uh, unique and pretty exciting because now you can get this full system that's made to work together 
to get really high magnification. And a teleconverter uh, only works with certain lenses, so you always have to look with your manufacturer and your mount. But if compatible, there's a glass element within the teleconverter, and that sits behind your lens in front of your body to bring more magnification. Going over to the right, we've got extension tubes. Extension tubes work similarly to a teleconverter, but there's no glass. They're just acting as spacers. They tend to be uh, fairly inexpensive, and they're a great way to get extra magnification out of uh, virtually any lens. They're really just moving your glass of your lens further from your sensor, and therefore projecting a more magnified image onto the sensor. And then the Raynox DCR250, uh, really great handy little tool. It's about $75. I know B&H carries them. Um, they're really popular. It's essentially a fancy magnifying glass that clips onto the end of your lens. Uh, works really well with most lenses. Uh, I have found that it doesn't work great with the 90 macro, but with the 60 macro, it's awesome. Uh, and with a lot of other lenses from other systems, it's awesome. And it's just going to give a boost to your magnification beyond what the lens sees natively. All right. So on the camera settings, everyone always wants to know my camera settings. Uh, you know, if you're a photographer at all, you know that all you need is the right camera settings and you'll make beautiful images, right? So I'm going to tell you my settings uh, and you're welcome to use them and, and go out into the field and try them out for yourself. Uh, these, of course, are for my OMM Mark II. If you're using an Olympus or OM system camera, these are going to be really directly uh, transferable to your camera. If you're using a different system, you may have to make slight adjustments, um, but these are my baseline settings. And what's really important for anyone, almost all cameras now, uh, at the higher end cameras, you know, your interchangeable lens cameras that have manual capabilities, they're going to offer custom modes. So on my camera, the label on the dial says C1, C2, C3, C4. Uh, other systems may say 1, 2, 3, 4, or have some other indication. But the idea is that you have different settings that you, the user, you, the photographer, customize for your settings for a certain scenario. So I could have a custom mode for macro, a custom mode for birds in flight, a custom mode for landscapes. And when I spin to that setting on the dial, those settings are remembered and they're there ready for me to use. And this is a huge time saver because you can spend years fine tuning your settings and then you go, you know, I'm shooting macro one day, a football game the next day, and all my settings are out of whack. All I have to do is turn to C1 and everything you see on the screen here is ready to go. So uh, when I'm in C1, my camera's behaving as it would in manual. My default is one one hundredth of a second. That may seem really slow, but remember I'm using a flash that lets me use slower shutter speeds. My aperture, if I'm using the 60, is at F8. If I'm using the 90, it's at F10. My ISO is natively 200 on the OMO Mark II. Therefore, I'm using the native ISO. That's going to give me the cleanest result with the least amount of noise. And I have a flash, right? So I can expose. I don't need my sensor to be more sensitive. I can use that base native ISO. Um, my autofocus targeting mode is set to single point. My focusing type is manual, and that's because I'm using back button focus. So I'm using a back button to focus and my shutter button is not doing any focusing. My drive mode is set to eight frames per second. That may seem slow. Uh, if you're familiar with the OM-1 Mark II, it can shoot 120 frames a second in RAW. I don't need that speed for this. My flash could never keep up, so I have that scaled back. My live view mode, is a simulated optical viewfinder. And again, that's because I'm using flash. I don't need to see a preview of my exposure before I take the photo. My flash is gonna handle that. So I just want a nice bright visual. I don't need face or eye detection. My image quality is raw, white balance set to auto and image stabilization is on auto. And then just a few more custom settings that are also mapped to C1 on my mode dial. I can change the buttons. Regardless of what the buttons are labeled, I can change them to do what I want them to do. So I'm not changing my ISO when I'm using a flash very often. I have that set to magnify my screen so I can look closer. My AF on button, that's my back button focus. Uh, I have buttons set for focus bracketing and focus stacking, and I'll explain that shortly. 
I have a button set for focus peaking, and then I also have a button for cases where I do turn my flash off, because I do that sometimes, I can turn um, the regular live view mode on, so I do see a preview of my exposure. And just so you can kind of get a sense of how that layout looks, here's a little schematic for you. Okay, on to focusing. So perfect focus is incredibly important for macro. It's of course important for any photography, but I feel like it's even more important, right? The closer you're looking, the more important that focus is. And when the entire frame is filled with a subject, you really have no room for error. Uh, missing focus, even by the tiniest bit, can be the difference between success and failure. So another really common question I get is, Chris, do you use autofocus or manual focus for macro? And the answer is both. Um, both have their places. I recommend autofocus for beginners. If you've never shot macro before, it's probably too tall of an order for you to try manually focusing right out of the gates. You need to practice. But autofocus is great. Lots of cameras, lots of modern systems offer really good autofocus and you should leverage that. Uh, it's especially important for fast moving subjects. And one that you might not think of is just finding your subject in the field of view. And what I mean by that is when you're really magnified, it's easy to get lost. I can be six inches from a subject, look down with my eyes outside of the viewfinder, and the subject is right in front of my lens. I look through my viewfinder, I can't find it. I'll just tap autofocus, the back button autofocus button, kind of center myself, and then I can move in and out manually. Manual focus is best as your experience grows, right? As your experience increases, you can start to use manual more. It's great for stationary subjects or when you have a controlled setting or achieving a specific magnification. Uh, and that really comes into play when you wanna hit that max magnification. In order to nail focus, um, you're really gonna to wanna to take advantage of the tools that your camera offers. And a lot of people don't take advantage of them. They don't even know that they're there. So you know, the old read your manual, look into the features that your camera has to help you achieve critical focus. And some examples of that are a focus limiter. A focus limiter can actually be part of your lens or in your camera. And what it's doing, regardless of if it's in camera or in lens, is setting a specific range at which your camera will seek focus. So you can say, ignore everything that's further than six inches away. I only wanna focus on things that are close. Or similarly, say you're photographing wildlife, at a distance, I wanna ignore everything that's closer than 10 meters away. I don't want the bird that's flying in the front or the stick that's blowing in the breeze. Um, I just want the lion that's across the savannah or whatever, right? So uh, use your focus limiter, know where you want to focus, be very deliberate about it. So when I'm photographing insects, most of the time, I wanna make sure that front plane of the eye is in focus. So really be deliberate about that. And when I say that I'm manually focusing, I'm typically not spinning the lens barrel or the sleeve around the lens, I'm gently moving in and out. And I'm gently moving until I see perfect focus on my screen or my viewfinder. And you can use focus peaking or manual focus assist magnification, which is what you see here in um, the image on the screen, where it's just a magnified view. My photo will not be that extremely magnified. Excuse me. My photo will be uh, seven times less magnified as is indicated in the corner of the screen, but I get to look closer and that lets me know exactly what's in focus. So some combination of these tools can really, really help you get the focus you need. Okay. We can't talk about macro without talking about magnification, right? I've probably said that word half a dozen times already, maybe more. I'm going to say it a lot more, um, but macro photos often showcase really high levels of magnification, and that's especially what we're talking about today. But that's all about the ratio of your subject size to the sensor size. And I mentioned earlier that I'm shooting with a four third sensor. So that's on the right in this chart. And I chose to photograph dimes because dimes are about the same width as my sensor. So on the right, bottom right corner, you see that the dime is filling the sensor. 
So the dime is representing one, the sensor is representing one, they're roughly the same size, and it fills the sensor. But that dime is only half the size of a full frame sensor. So the output looks less zoomed in or magnified, even though the dime is the same size and they're both one, um, one X, I guess, right? But there's a crop factor of two with the four third sensor, so it looks double. So that's what we talk about, like this perceived magnification or the difference between different sensor sizes. Um, but I show this first because for the next couple of examples, I'm going to talk about different magnification with my camera, and I'm going to talk in terms of uh, its sensor size. So here we have one to four magnification. That means that the subject is one fourth the size of the sensor. It's filling one fourth of that field of view. This would be half. This would be one to one. And with the 90 macro, I can actually go to two to one. So two times the size of the sensor. So I'm filling half the sensor now because I've gone beyond the size of the sensor. The next step is to understand how close you need to be. So back to the theme from today's presentation of up close, how close do I have to get to my subject to get these results? So on the top left, quarter size, no pun intended on the dime, one fourth size. With the 90 macro, I'm about 14 inches from my glass of my lens. My working distance is about 14 inches to get that type of result. And yes, I'm using dimes here. This is not insects in the field. But when you understand these things, you can start to ballpark your distances from your subject and understand how much magnification you're going to get. To get that half magnification, it's about six inches away. To get one to one, one X magnification with the 90 macro, I'm a little less than four inches away from the glass. And then a little over two and a half inches away to get the full maximum two to one magnification with the 90 macro. So as you can imagine, that's pretty close, right? Like when you're working with live subjects, that is pretty close. But in reality, two and five eighths inches from the glass is a fair bit of working distance relative to some other macro lenses that are on the market, even uh, compared to say the 30 millimeter macro from OM system. So Two and five eighths inches is relatively close, but it is not as close as some other lenses. And that little bit of extra working distance can make all the difference in scaring your subject or in getting enough light in between your lens and the subject. So it is a nice amount of working distance. And to further explain working distance, I wanna really reiterate that this is the distance between the subject and the glass. So to get 1x magnification out of the 90 macro, I'm that three and three quarters of an inch away. To get that maximum magnification, I'm two and five eighths inches away. But just be careful with the term working distance versus focusing distance, because a lot of spec charts will show focusing distance. And that's actually the distance from subject to sensor. So on this camera, it's about 8.8 .8 inches of focusing distance. That's the minimum focusing distance, which will achieve the maximum magnification. You might see that and think, oh, wow, I can be almost nine inches away from my subject to get maximum magnification. You actually have to be much closer because you need to get to that working distance. Um, focusing distance is measured to the sensor and the sensor is right there. Ooh, let me go back. So every camera should have a little indicator on the side. It's a circle with a line through it. And that's your sensor plane. So if you take your camera, whatever it is, and look up whatever lens you have on it and search the uh, minimum focusing distance for that lens, you can literally set this experiment up with a ruler and you can measure from subject to sensor plane, and that will be the closest you can be and have your lens still uh, focus. It will also be the most magnified your result will be. 
So again, this is all like, you know, on a screen, in a class, in the studio, not in the field, but understanding it can, I know that when I approach a subject in the field, if I get into that two and a half to three inches away, that's the area I need to hover in to get the most magnification and can still focus. And of course, there's some options to get more magnification. Uh, I showed them earlier, extension tubes, teleconverters, Raynox, and I just want to show you the impact on magnification. So I won't spend too much time on these, but this is the 60 macro uh, by itself with the DCR 250 and then with extension tubes. So you can see that natively on the left, that's what the lens can do. And then you can add these accessories to get even more magnification where it gets pretty wild is with the 90 macro, which on its own is capable of what you see here. You can add a teleconverter to get that, and you can add a more powerful teleconverter to get that. So now you're working with you know four or five millimeter field of view, insane magnification. I will say that while I shot this handheld and you can work handheld, I always shoot handheld. Every image you'll see today was made handheld it gets really, really hard at this magnification. So uh, just understand that camera shake is going to be very much in play at these magnifications, regardless of image stabilization. Okay, managing depth of field. So depth of field is a big, big enemy with macro photography. We're always trying to get more, which is almost the reverse, right? You talk about portraits and you want that shallow depth of field and the beautiful bokeh in the background. Um, but with macro, we always want more because our subjects are tiny, we're really close to them and we need to uh, expand the depth of the field. So I have three examples here, all shot at F16. Yes, F16, you might think, uh, I only shoot at F18 because that's the best. Um, F16 doesn't give you as much depth of field as you would think with macro. And I want to illustrate that here. So I have my tiny little uh, Olympus camera model on top of a lens cap. So it kind of shows you the scale of it there. And this is shot at F16, 18 inches away. I then moved in still at F16 to nine inches away. And all of a sudden, even at F16, you see that that Olympus logo and the OMD logo, they're pretty soft. Okay, so we're really losing depth of field quickly. If I go in closer, closer to that minimum working distance, and now four and a half inches away, only the front of the lens is in focus. The word Olympus, the OMD logo, completely out of focus, totally soft. My depth of field is gone, even at F16. So here's a side by side by side. This is those three images. And if I scale them to match, even though they're all at F16, and you think, oh, I, I kind of understand what F16 does to my depth of field. When you bring in that factor of working distance or distance from subject, you start to see how depth of field disappears when you get closer. Um, so you can look at this in two ways. You can say, oh, if I get really close, I limit my depth of field. But you can also say, if I don't have enough depth of field, one way to manage that is just move back a little. You know, you can crop and post, or maybe you can just have more subject in the frame, but you will get more depth of field simply by backing away. And here's a real world example. So I wanna make sure I am showing you the real stuff, right? So here's a red eye tree frog. This is uh, shot at F8 but I'm fairly far back from the frog when I made this photo and most of it is in focus. But 30 seconds later, I stepped up closer, same exact settings. I didn't change any settings on my camera, but way less is in focus. Really just the eye is in focus. Even part of the eye that's coming closest is falling out just a tiny bit. Um, so same settings, but you see the difference in the perceived depth of field as you move in and out. Um, so that's all great, right? Okay, I understand. But what about when you want big magnification, the smaller apertures aren't cutting it for you or they're not giving you the look you want, and you want to take advantage of the dreamy bokeh that your lens can produce, 
when you use bigger apertures? Well, say hello to focus bracketing and focus stacking. Um, I could give a whole workshop for hours and I've done it on focus bracketing and focus stacking. I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has them. But today I really just want to introduce you for you know five minutes or 10 minutes about focus bracketing and focus stacking. Um, focus bracketing refers to shooting a series of images where you're varying the focus from shot to shot. Focus stacking is assembling or compositing those images so you're just taking the in-focus areas from each shot, blending them together. All of the out-of-focus areas are staying out of focus, right? So you get to create this uh, kind of extreme depth of field by stacking images together. And real quick, the benefits of bracketing, you increase your chance of hitting perfect focus because you're, you're varying focus. So maybe one shot's in and one shot's out. Um, but most often you're doing this so you can composite those images into a focus stack. And here's just an illustration of how bracketing kind of works. Your initial focus starts usually closest to your lens, and then you step back into space. Um, you can do that in a number of ways. You can literally just put your camera in a high speed burst mode and push forward and inherently your focus will step back into space It's very unscientific but it can work for short uh, bracketed series you can use a focusing rail where you're incrementally adjusting focus very manually um, or my favorite way and what i feel like is the easiest and perhaps the best way is to automate focus bracketing in camera so my camera has it some other manufacturers offer similar features where i can press the shutter button one time I just set my initial focus and then focus is incrementally shifted from shot to shot up to 999 frames. So I can go back into space as, as few or as many uh, increments as I choose. So why would you want to focus stack? I kind of alluded to it when I was talking, uh, showing those frogs, but the benefits of focus stacking include controlling exactly which areas of your image end up focus, producing a greater perceived depth of field than you would with just a single frame, increasing depth of field while taking advantage of those larger apertures, or producing this kind of exaggerated sense of sharpness. Uh, and it really tends to come with less noise as well, because noise usually hides in the out of focus areas. So when you're focus stacking, you're taking a lot of in focus the best parts of photos, blending them together, and you're kind of ignoring the noisy parts. So you get this really hyper sharp, hyper clean result. Well, how do you do it, right? <laughs> okay, you understand now what it is, but how do you actually focus stack? There's several options. You can do it with uh, software, you can, maybe you can do it in camera, and I'm gonna kind of take you through what both look like. First, I want to cover why, not just how. You know, I gave you some reasons why, but I want to show you why. Because you might be thinking, well, I could just shoot at f16, like you said, right? F16, I back up a little, I'll get everything in focus. That's absolutely true. This image of the flower was shot at f16, but you get some distracting background and foreground elements because everything starts to come into focus. The next shot here is framed very similarly, 12 images stacked, each one shot at f4, you get that soft out of focus quality that people tend to like, right? So you've got the flower in focus, no distracting elements with all the grass, and it has a much different quality to it. So there's nothing wrong with either image, of course it's up to you, but if you like the way that the image on the right looks better, you can achieve that through focus stacking. And here's another example. Uh, here we see the depth of field that I got when I photographed this spider, one shot at f6.3 versus 20 shots at f6.3. And then here's a closer look, f6.3, just the eyes are in focus. You know, maybe that's the drama you're looking for, but if you want everything or more in focus, then you can stack images together like this, 
to get a greater depth of field. And here's what it looks like. We take a series of bracketed shots and then merge them together. So here I shot 15 bracketed frames. I know that they probably all look very similar up on the screen, but I'll direct your attention to shot number one. So you see the legs in focus, it closest to the lens. Again, I'm starting closest to the lens. And then here, almost nothing's in focus because I'm back behind the spider now. So it's just those hairs on the back of the spider's head. But when I merge all of those images together, and this was done with Helic and Focus, which is focus stacking software, the result looks like that. Okay, so I went from 15 frames where kind of nothing was in focus, and then I have this one composited frame where everything that I want is in focus. So I just mentioned Helic and Focus. I, Again, I don't have the time to go into all the details of how Helic and Focus works, but I wanted to put a visual to it so you could kind of wrap your head around what's happening. I'm taking a series of images, whether it's five or 10 or 100 frames, I'm putting them into the software. The software recognizes, analyzes and recognizes the in-focus areas, and then it composites them together automatically. So here's that, what that process looks like for that Carpenter Bee image. And there's the stack, okay? So all of those black and white high contrast frames, that was the in-focus areas, they blend together. And then I can take and finalize that image to my liking, and that's the final result. So that's what Helic and Focus, or Photoshop can do it, or Serene Stacker. Those are PC software options but you can also do this right in camera. So here's a similar illustration about initial focus and then the subsequent frames. Um, there are some limitations uh, on OM systems offering for in-camera stacking. We can do three to 15 shots. You actually have the first shot at your initial focus, a couple of shots kind of come back toward you to make sure you didn't miss anything. And then it goes through the subject into space. But Honestly, it is magic. Uh, you know, a couple of limitations here, right? It works a little differently. You can only do 15 shots, but it is so easy and the results are incredible. Um, it's a really, really nice option that saves a ton of time. And I wanted to kind of illustrate just like I did with Helic and Focus how that looks. So here's a flower. This is exactly what you would see on your LCD screen as it's happening. You see those slight shifts into space as the shots are taken through the subject. And then literally like magic, a few seconds go by and that's the image that you'll see on the back of the screen. Uh, this is just slightly pushed uh, in Lightroom, but it's a JPEG that comes out. I just adjust contrast to finalize it to my liking, but virtually no edit necessary. It's all happening in camera, huge time saver and a ton of fun, uh, especially if you don't really do a ton of macro photography and you say like, oh, that would be neat if I could do that. The feature's right there and it works great. Okay, we're in the home stretch now. Um, hopefully this is where you say, okay, that was all great. I forgot half of what he said already. What can I take away and apply to my photography? Um, and I have five bite-sized tips that uh, I hope you can apply immediately and I hope they improve your macro. So number one, no matter what presentation I'm giving about photography, I think this is almost always my number one tip. It's my number one tip for general macro. It's also my number one tip for high magnification macro and that's be patient. Um, it's really, really important. You need to slow down, you need to relax, you need to calm your breathing. Um, but if you can do all of that, you will find more subjects, you will have better results, and you will be rewarded. Tip number two, accept failure. Don't be afraid to miss. Uh, I miss all the time. In fact, I miss a ton of shots, probably more shots than I want to admit. But you know what? I don't share those. Right? Here's one that I missed, and I actually didn't get the shot that I wanted. But if you're patient, like I said just a minute ago, if you accept the fact that you're not always going to get the shot that you dream of, uh, 
more opportunities are usually right around the corner and uh, you know your patience will pay off and your acceptance of failure will pay off and you will walk away with the shots that you wanted. Okay, tip number three, I find this one to be really, really important, especially at this time of year. So my favorite time of year for macro is of course when the weather's nicer. I live in Pennsylvania it, in February, it's not great for insects and spiders. Um, I'll use this time to practice indoors and I'll practice with inanimate subjects. And this is great for someone who's experienced or someone who's just beginning. Here I just have a little nut and bolt set up on my desktop but you can use these little items in your house to test your settings, to fine tune your custom settings on your camera, understand lighting, experiment. You do all of this in the comfort of your own home with the variables minimized, save the settings, understand how it works. Then when you go into the field, you're way better set up for success. Tip number four, focus forward. So here you see what looks like an out of focus photo. That's because I was shooting a bracketed series and I set, set my initial focus forward of my subject, closer to my lens than the subject itself. It is totally fine to take frames that are out of focus on your way to getting the frames in focus. This happens very quickly. So if I get two or three or four frames in front of the dragonfly, that's better than missing two or three or four frames on the dragonfly's face, right? Like I don't want from halfway through its head back, I need its whole head to be in focus. You can throw those frames away. So set your focus in front of your subject, shoot your series through the subject and throw away the frames that you don't need later. And there's what it actually looks like once it's all stacked. And number five, brace yourself. I already said, I don't shoot with a tripod. I've never shot a macro photo in the field with a tripod. I don't bring it with me, but I still need to brace myself. Movement, whether it's your camera shake, your subject wiggling around or twitching, those are your worst enemies. But even though you don't have a tripod, that doesn't mean you can't get yourself stable. Lay down on the ground, lean up against a post or a tree or a tree stump use your surroundings get in a very comfortable position so you're not physically shaking uh, lean against a rock whatever it may be and that's going to again minimize a variable the variable being movement in this case and it's going to set you up for a much better chance uh, at a sharp result especially if you're shooting a series for focus stack And then one bonus tip I always like to remind people because it's probably the most important thing is to have fun. Uh, macro in the field, I think it's hard. Um, high magnification macro, focus stacking, live subjects, no tripod, unpredictable scenarios, like this is even harder. When you're out in the field and you're sweating and you're missing shots and things aren't in focus and you're, you, know, you feel like it's a bad day, really just remember to enjoy your time out in nature, uh, you're exercising, you're experiencing new things, you know, all these things are positive. So if you can focus on the joy of the experience, you will never be disappointed. And that is that. So thank you all. And uh, I think we probably have some time for questions, Derek, if any came in, I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes, definitely. And I want to thank Mike for working the perfect one, two combo with you in the background, getting some questions answered. Oh, great. Yeah. I couldn't see any of it. So thanks, Mike. I'm sure you were all over it. Yeah, I was doing my best. There are a couple that came in for you, but I, I did my best to, to hold off the crowd. He's okay. knocking them down. <laughs> Mike, I actually want to, while we have you here, is there anything that you saw? Because I know you did get some questions asked yeah. uh, for, for the Zoom crowd here. Mm -hmm. uh, out of those questions in there, is there anything uh, that you, you think would be relevant? You know, you guys know what people are asking, what people always want to know. So if yeah, we can dig into those Q&A questions. Sure. There's a couple that came in. Uh, Chris, there's a couple that came in that I wanted to really sort of ask you, because you do a lot more macro than I do. I'm more birding. Mm -hmm. um, the One of them is the... Um, uh, the, the MC 20, the two X yeah. teleconverter on the 90 macro, um, mm -hmm. as far as loss of image quality, 
what do you see on there when you're using that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when I first heard about the 90 and that it was going to be compatible with teleconverters, I was super excited. I thought I was going to use it all the time. I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. In reality, I almost never use it. And it's not because of a loss of quality. And I'll, I'll get to that part of the answer in a second. It's because 2X or like that 4X equivalent is a lot. Like, I don't feel like I need to go beyond its native capabilities and add the teleconverter very often, but I have shot with it. Uh, I shot with it on the trip to Costa Rica when we did the promo. And um, I'll say the hardest part is not a loss of image quality because I really don't notice any discernible image quality loss uh, with macro, especially because you've got a flash, you've kind of uh, you're shooting at low ISO. So I feel like image quality is totally fine. Uh, no issue there. It's the movement at that magnification, like I mentioned. It's just harder to shoot. So even though I don't recommend shooting with a tripod, I think that for the best results, uh, not due to the image quality loss of a teleconverter, but due to the magnification, you will have some trouble um, that you need to mitigate with a, a tripod or you know some other way to control your scenario. Sure. Sure. The only other one I saw, and there's a couple that are coming in now, but the only other one I saw was uh, and the STF-8. I know you use the FL700 WR uh, yep. flash mostly. Um, so I figured it's more of a personal question as far as macro. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that? On that macro? Yeah. So uh, people ask me that a lot because they say, oh, I know that OM has a this STF-8. So it's a twin macro flash setup. It's great. It's weather sealed, uh, offers tons of control. So all of those are good things. And you would think, well, why don't you use it? I do have it, um, but I find that uh, for really two main reasons, I like the FL700 better for field work. If I was photographing jewelry or you know still life setups that were really tiny, I would absolutely use the STF-8 because it gives you tons of control. You can move your light sources in a different direction. You can have more power on one side than the other, and it, it works fantastically for that. But in the field, the two issues that I have and why I like the single mount flash better is the catch light, especially for jumping spiders. I want that kind of arcing white in the top of the spider's eyes. I like that look better than two uh, catch lights from the STF-8 mm -hmm. and the ability to diffuse the light. Even though the STF-8 does have diffuser caps that come with the flash units, um, they're really close to the subject. And I find it hard to manage that diffusion on the fly in the field um, with the STF-8 versus uh, a single mount speed light. Right. Cool. Now, now, Chris, I do, I do see we have a lot of questions coming in, so I do want to address this to everybody. We do have to end shortly, um, and I know you guys have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to try to get to some ones that might not be the normal macro questions, but I, I will remind you that we did drop Chris's information into the, the comment section, and you guys can re-watch this on our YouTube channel. Uh, a question that came in is an interesting question. Any non-macro lenses that will work for macro purposes? That's a great question. And you know what? Uh, that is something that when I'm in a longer presentation, I actually get into that, but I'm happy to cover it now, is one of the other features that I love about OM system, and I, I guess it's kind of by nature of the four-third sensor, is the close focusing ability of a lot of the lenses. So in addition to the 90 macro or the 60 macro, which I use as my workhorses for macro, I like to have a 40 to 150 f2.8 pro lens which is a telephoto lens. It's more of a birding lens or wildlife lens, right? But for dragonflies or butterflies that maybe at midday don't let you get super close, they're bigger subjects. I can focus from three feet away with the 40 to 150 and fill my frame and you know still focus with a telephoto lens. Uh, similarly, the 300 millimeter or the 150 to 400, if you really want to go for it, uh, these are great close focusing options that are actually telephoto lenses that, um, you know, it's not true macro, it's not one to one, they'll call it like telemacro, um, but it's like uh, 0.5x, you know, 0.25 to 0.5x, even I think 0.7 on uh, maybe the 150 to 400. So pretty good magnification from a distance. Awesome. Well, Chris, I want to thank you, Mike, Ashley, the entire OM system team. Again, I do apologize to our viewers out there. I think this this is all the more reason to get you back on because it seems like the, the question and answer session, session is – that's where it's at, man. We got a ton of questions coming in. do want to remind you guys we did get Chris's information dropped on there, so definitely go throw him a follow on Instagram and check out his website for more of his work. And, uh, and, and yeah, Derek, thank you for mentioning that, and I certainly invite everybody to follow. I 
absolutely try to respond to everything that comes through any of those channels. So if you didn't get a question answered today, or if you have questions about my gear or anything else, uh, happy to answer them anytime. Awesome. And we thank you for extending that offer there. Uh, again, a huge thank you to the OM system team and Chris, Mike, thank you for doing such a great job behind the scenes. there, getting those questions answered and to all of our viewers out there. Thank you guys for staying engaged and interested. It's all we got for you now. Another edition of the BNH virtual event space in the books. Catch y'all next time. Thanks guys. Thanks guys.